let's begin with the word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the study here this evening. We thank you for the Sabbath and the fellowship that we can have. And we invite your presence and your comfort um, in this sin-suffering world. And we just pray, Lord, that the things we study here this evening will draw us closer to you and that we can um, reflect your character to all around us, that you can help us in our day-to-day struggles. Please be with us now through thy spirit. We pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, happy Sabbath, everyone. And um, so we're continuing reading through 1888 Reexamined. And there's just a lot of good history here and and some very good ideas. But, you know, as we go through this, people feel free if you have a comment to make or a question or, you know, just anything. I know it ends up being mostly me reading and talking and commenting, but people, you know, don't need to be afraid to to interrupt me if you have something that's going to be helpful. Okay. So um, what we're looking at right now in this chapter, because we we started reading a little bit of it, but or section has to do with the Holy Spirit uh, was insulted. So this is a statement in the spirit of prophecy saying that um, uh, that the Holy Spirit was shut out um, from the people. And this is something that, of course, would not be the main stream view about 1888 and 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 we're saying that holy spirit wasn't just shut out you know at that meeting and that was it it continued to be resisted the truth continued to be resisted now um you know we've talked a lot about this this history at least um uh our understanding of it in the 1980s obviously this was was a huge issue 1888 uh being the hundred year anniversary, 1988, um, and this book was uh, published just at the end of 1987 in preparation for that um, centennial. Now, so I've seen, you know, personally, uh, what this message has done and how it has not really been accepted, even by the conservative Adventists who believed that they were accepting it. And, and that's, that's always been a huge problem with this message is that it's this message that needs to be understood and yet it needs the Holy Spirit in order to understand it. And, and I believe one of the reasons why it hasn't been understood is it, it has been more a battleground rather than people really just trying to on a, on an individual basis accept the truth, right? And we see this with so many things in Adventism. You know, one thing, you know, Kelly, you've um, seen a friend of ours, Adam, you know, talking about uh, anti-Trinitarianism, right? And it's fine. So let's say, like, I have no problem with how he believes. You know, he can believe that way. Where I really have the problem is his insistence that other people who don't believe in the way that he does are somehow in apostasy. And, and my view on, on things like the Godhead is based and based on Ellen White's writings is that this is something that really isn't, it's not an issue, right? There's obviously certain things we need to know. We need to know that Jesus is God and that we can have a relationship with him, that he's the one that represents the Father. The Holy Spirit, uh, is the Spirit of the Father and of the Son and and it's through the Holy Spirit that Christ and the Father can be present in our lives. But how to explain that, you know, should not be a battleground. It shouldn't be um, something that we then attack others for. And and I think, you know, in this issue of righteousness by faith, I mean, I remember one friend of mine, he said, you know, he had a screaming match in the parking lot with a pastor over this issue of the nature of Christ. And, you know, is that really representing the truth? 
when we come to know the truth, that truth is supposed to have an effect on our lives. It's to change us. And if it changes us, then the Holy Spirit can use us to reach others. But if we're just dealing with well, it talks here about suspicion and jealousy. I mean, those things exist on both sides and have existed on both sides of this discussion within Adventism for a long time. And, you know, the truth is supposed to unite us to Christ and it should unite us with one another. But often, even within conservative ranks, all of these fine distinctions over how to understand the truth they just become battlegrounds that really represent that that reveal our character in a negative way. So we're going to look at what happened in 1888, and we're going to try to apply this to our experience at the present time. So um, the paragraph before the Ellen White quote says, what is important in understanding 1888 is not the negative attitude of a few individuals, a so-called die-hard minority, but the spirit which controlled or prevailed at the 1888 conference and thereafter. This is what had a determinative effect on that generation and has had on every generation since. Ellen White is clear about that controlling influence. So this is from <clears throat> manuscript 30, 1889, and uh, another quote from letters. S24, 1892, another quote from Testimonies to Ministers 393, and another one from Testimonies to Ministers 64. So there's a few different quotes put together here. <clears throat> I met with the brethren in the tabernacle and felt it my duty to give a short history of the meeting and my experience at Minneapolis. The course I had pursued and why, and plainly state the spirit which prevailed at that meeting, I told them of the hard position I was placed in to stand, as it were, alone and be compelled to reprove the wrong spirit that was the controlling power at that meeting. The suspicion and jealousy, the evil surmising, the resistance of the spirit of God that was appealing to them were more after the order in which the reformers had been treated it was the very order in which the Methodist church had treated my father's family and eight of us. I stated that the course that had been pursued at Minneapolis was cruelty to the spirit of God. The opposing brethren were moved at the meeting uh, by another spirit, and they knew not that God had sent these young men to bear a special, special message to them, which they treated with ridicule and contempt, not realizing that the heavenly intelligences were looking upon them. I know that, at the time, the Spirit of God was insulted. Sins are lying at the door of many. The Holy Spirit has been insulted and light has been rejected. Some have treated the Spirit as an unwelcome guest, refusing to receive the rich gift, refusing to acknowledge it, turning from it and condemning it as fanaticism. Now, of course, as we pointed out, this isn't just something that happened in 1888. It's, it's a spirit that exists um, anytime the truth is presented. And, and, of course, the reason for that has to do with men love darkness rather than light. Men want to continue in their sins. And the message that repro reproves and rebukes them is not welcome. And people will have many reasons why, you know, the 2520 shouldn't be listened to. It's doing all this kind of damage or whatever it is being presented, whether it's, you know, July 18th or chronology or, or other things. And, and how we react to what we see as error is important. Now, the thing is, even when something that's presented that we think is error, we have to look at it openly and honestly. And, and this is something that we have tried to do. Are we always successful in doing it? I don't think I am always successful in doing that. But I try. And, you know, we've had a lot of things going on within this movement. And I've tried to look at what people are saying 
and examine it. Now, sometimes I have a hard time with it myself personally, but is I think what is being presented has problems with it. And I can point out the problems. But the one thing I don't want to do is attack the person. Now, sometimes, you know, in a situation, I try to figure out why is this person doing what they're doing? Maybe, maybe there's a reason, but I don't think that I can judge the person's motives. I don't think I can stand in condemnation of a person who's, who believes something incorrectly because that's not the basis for being saved or being lost. Correct understanding. We all have things that we believe that are wrong. We, now, of course, the attitude that a person has, how they deal with others, that's, that's more important. But even then, you have to be quite forgiving because you don't really know what that person's motives are and why they're doing what they're doing. So to judge a person and to judge their motives, I don't think that that's our place. We can look at what they're presenting and analyze it and compare it with scripture. But that doesn't tell us anything about that person. So, and this of course was what was happening at Minneapolis. It wasn't, they weren't, they weren't examining the light. They rejected it based upon their feelings. Anyway, we're going to go and read more of what um, the writers say here. The idea of insulting the Holy Spirit is more than a passing hyperbole. This tragedy affects us today as surely as the Jews' mistake of long ago affects them today. A sin that an individual committed long ago as an insult to another person remains as a burden on his or her conscience and affects the character and personality. This continue, can continue for decades as long as both individuals live and until repentance and restitution take place. Likewise, the consciousness of the corporate body of the church, our denominational character and personality, our standing before heaven, the spirit that permeates our churches, are affected negatively by this vital episode of our history. Our environmental heritage is inescapable. Jeremiah says that the sin of Judah is engraved on the tablet of the heart with the point of, an, of adamant, and it extends from one generation to another. Until repentance takes place, we doom ourselves to repeat the sins of our fathers. Alienation from the Holy Spirit is deeply moved, involved. Now, this is a basic belief of uh, Wieland and Short. So the idea is that there needs to be this corporate repentance. That we, we had an event that happened in our church in 1888. And... That sin has continued to permeate and affect negatively everything that the church has done since then. It's, it's handicapped the church. And their view is that the corporate body of the church, uh, the leadership all the way down, all the way on down, needs to repent of this sin of 1888. So what do you think of that idea? Now, they're not going to it in detail here, but just that's that's the idea that they have. There's this the corporate body has been affected. And just like Christ was crucified, that we need to repent. The church needs to repent of. And until they do, the church will never be able to accomplish its work. So their view is not that individuals need to repent that the church does. Our talent brother Theodore, how, what is point of an adamant? What is but, adamant? It's like an engraving tool. It's an adamant stone used to engrave. Just an engraving tool. Well, I, I pulled it up and it's giving me a different meaning to it. Refusing well, to, it says an adjustment or refusing to be pers- yeah, or to change. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a modern that's a modern meaning. The word okay. adamant is a type of stone that's very, very hard. Right. So somebody who's adamant, that's okay. just you know, somebody who's like he's very, you know, this is how it's going to be. Okay. Right? But here it's talking about stone. 
a point of an adamant. An adamant is the type of stone that's very hard. Okay. Um, flint is that what the it says here? So flint is, is that is that the same thing as an adamant stone? I was thinking it would be Just, something like that. Yeah, and and I know with flint you you chip it off and then it becomes very very sharp. You can cut things with it. But I don't know much about it. To be but, yes. blunt, to be blunt about your question, is okay. there is there ever going to be a corporate repentance of the church? No, it ain't going to happen. Yeah. Was there a corporate repentance of the Jews in crucifying Christ? No. No. Was there a corporate repentance of the Protestants in accepting the first and second angels' messages? No. No. Now, so one of the whole premises of this movement is that there's a repeat of history. The first and second angels' messages have to be repeated in order for the third angel's message to actually accomplish its work, right? So this is something that um, Wieland and Short don't understand, right? They, you know, they're writing this before 1989, right? And they're not part of this movement. So, so this is something that this movement came to understand, which to me answered a question that I always had, right? Because we saw the condition of the church, and I knew about, you know, Wheelands and Short's books and their view on about corporate repentance. And, you know, are we going to see the church repent? Now, the what we do and what we believe that has to happen is there is a message that goes to Adventists, but that the majority forsake us, right? So that most Adventists, what we see today in Adventism is... People are Adventists, they're social Adventists, they're cultural Adventists. Many Adventists have their jobs in the Adventist church. You know, they, they work in Adventist hospitals and Adventist schools. They're, they're part of this culture or society of Adventists. But their, their understanding of Adventism and their belief in Adventism is fairly nominal. And those people, even if the leadership were to somehow see their sin and repent, the vast majority of the church would not accept it. But the chance of that happening, the majority of our leadership uh, deciding that, you know, we were wrong about 1888 and, um, you know, we never did accept that message. That's not just going to happen. One is it's not going to happen, but also it could not happen if we do not understand the first and second angels messages. So in order to bring about a reform in the church, because there is going to be a reform, there is going to be a revival. It would be necessary to have the first and second angels messages repeated. And that's why this movement was raised up. Now, when, when I look at the movement from this is my perspective and I see what happened with July 18th, July 18th. And I see what Jeff is doing now in writing again. I can see that the movement has not understood its role and its responsibility. And that Jeff in writing those articles is actually abandoning his responsibility in a pretense of taking upon himself the responsibility that was given to him. And that's because he's really rejecting his, his message because everything that, that his message was, was led by God to make the July 18th, 2020 prediction. And, and once he, he rejects that as a deception, as an error, as a sin, he's actually rejected everything else before. And, and you can see that in his articles that it's now a mishmash of application out of context, not following line upon line, right? We don't see Jeff drawing out lines. We just see a bunch of, of text that have no connection with each other. And so this movement isn't any different than the church. Does that make sense to people? 
that, that we are no better than the church. And, and I'm not saying, you know, Jeff is no better than the church. I'm saying we are not better than the church. The only thing that we can do is recognize the first, second, and third angels' messages. That righteousness by faith is the third angel's message in verity. That is all the first and second angels' messages are righteousness by faith. Right? God has placed before us all of the evidences we need in order to exercise faith and represent him. And we're failing at every turn within this movement. We can't treat each other with respect. We're critical. We're envious. So all of these things, and we're resisting the Holy Spirit. We're condemning others. So why is this happening again within our movement that happened in 1888? Why is that? Why why does history keep repeating itself? Because it's so much easier to condemn the faults of others rather than looking at ourselves and condemning the faults in ourselves. Well, yes. So but we need to learn that that's, that's the only way that we're going to be saved. So, I mean, it is true, until repentance takes place, we doom ourselves to repeat the sins of our fathers. But that's not going to happen at at a corporate level. It happens at an individual level. Okay, so this, um, we're going to keep reading more Whelan and Short before we read some more Spirit of Prophecy. The Holy Spirit is a person, not a mere influence or an ethereal it. He can be grieved. This keen concept of the personality of God as the Holy Spirit pervades the Hebrew scriptures. The prophets were constantly representing God as the disappointed, grieved lover of Israel's soul. The idea is unique to Israel, for no pagan religion had any such concept of a jealous divine personality. The same truth pervades the New Testament and is also impressively emphasized in Ellen White's testimonies. However, the idea is generally lacking in modern Catholic and Protestant teaching. A full appreciation of this reality is unique to those who will welcome the Lord at his second coming. For they are corporately represented as a bride who has at last made herself ready for the intimate relationship of marriage. Revelation 19.7-9, the 1900s alpha heresy of pantheism attacked this truth of the personality of the Holy Spirit. The Omega will doubtless renew that error. Now, this is, of course, a whole other can of worms that's being opened here, which we don't want to spend too much time on. But when we look at what was happening with the pantheism of, of well, we also have you know, Wagner and um, um, Kellogg and others. Uh, He makes an interesting observation here that what was being attacked was the truth of the personality of the Holy Spirit. And I don't know if people have read The Living Temple by Kellogg, I have, and also um, The Everlasting Covenant by Wagner, where he lays out his pantheistic views very clearly. But the idea of the Holy Spirit that they have is that the Holy Spirit is. Is everything is made of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a person. It's some kind of influence or ethereal it. Right. And there's many people who think that in attacking the personality of the Holy Spirit, they're going back to some truth uh, that the pioneers taught. But do Catholics believe in the personality of the Holy Spirit? I would say no. No. No, because what they believe in is mysticism. We're not mystics. Seventh-day Adventists don't believe in mysticism. Pantheism is a type of mysticism. Now, we don't understand the Holy Spirit. But the one thing we say about the Holy Spirit is it's Christ personally coming to us through his spirit. It's not an impersonal force. It's not some kind of divine influence operating on man. It is 
it is Christ, right? We, we can know Christ through his spirit. The spirit doesn't reveal himself. He reveals Christ. And, and that's all we need to know. But the, you know, we talk about the alpha and omega and, and omega, right? So what is the omega error? There's different people who've written books about it. Uh, but part of it is just an emphasis upon the human understanding of God. Because that's what the alpha was. Anyway, that, that's kind of an aside, but it's something to consider. And I'm not saying I understand everything about the Holy Spirit and about the Godhead. But I do know what the Bible reveals. And, and that's what I try to stick to, not to man's explanations. Anyway, grieved and insulted, he has the right to retribution. And how can he seek it? Consistent with his character of love. His retribution is more poignantly painful to endure than any other. For it will still be the voice of love that speaks. Um, there will be messages born, and those who have rejected the message God has sent will hear most startling declarations. Injured and insulted deity will speak, proclaiming the sins that have been hidden. As the priests and rulers, full of indignation and terror, sought refuge in flight at the last scene of the cleansing of the temple, so will it be in the work for these last days. Special Testimony Series A, number 7, page 54 and 55. The context of this statement is a discussion of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Okay, so this is about Adventists. It's about the Adventist Church and what's going to happen. Okay, so this next one, Jesus Christ was spurned and insulted. This is also difficult for us to see. Again, the personality of the Son of God is an issue. Does he have feelings as we humans do? Can he be grieved? What happened in our 1888 history seems so astonishing that the story would be incredible if it were not clearly told in the writings of Ellen White. Her discernment was inspired. The meek and lowly Jesus, Jesus still chooses messengers who are only men, who are like a root out of a dry ground. He condescended to identify himself with the 1888 messengers and was grieved and insulted when the heavenly credentials he gave them were despised. So from testimony, uh, Testimonies to Ministers 97, page 97, here was evidence that all might discern whom the Lord recognized as his servants. These men whom you have spoken against have been as signs in the world, as witnesses for God. If you reject Christ's delegated messengers, you reject Christ. To accuse and criticize those whom God is using is to accuse and criticize the Lord who sent them. With many, the cry of the heart has been, we will not have this man Christ to reign over us. The true religion, the only religion of the Bible that teaches forgiveness only through the merits of a crucified and risen Savior, that advocates righteousness by the faith of the Son of God, has been slighted, spoken against, ridiculed, and rejected. The present message is a message from God. It bears the divine credentials, for its fruit is unto holiness. This message, as it has been presented by Jones and Wagner, should go to every church that claims to believe the truth and bring our people up to a higher standpoint. We want to see who have presented to the world the heaven the heavenly credentials. So this is that one's from March 18th, 1890. This one's from other quotes put together. Uh, but even in modern times, our esteemed church historian casts contempt upon the messenger, if not upon the message itself. Now, of course, we know from 1888 to apostasy by George R. Knight, that book is uh, doing exactly that work of attacking Jones particularly, but also Wagner, and, you know, attacking their character. So if somebody is presenting something that we don't like, and, and I've said this many times, if it's error, what do we have to do to counteract it? Search it out to see if it's true. 
Okay, well, we search it out, and now we, we've we searched it out. If it's error, what we would have to do is just show the truth. Would we need to attack the person's character? No, we do not. No, there would be no need for it. It actually would be uh, disad- disadvantageous. You know, one of the things that I think the church makes a mistake of, even when somebody is presenting error, instead of just addressing what's being presented, even when it's error, instead of just showing what the truth is, they tend to attack the person. It's kind of laziness. Because in order to counteract error, you're going to have to know the truth. Right? So, but people don't want to spend the time studying and understanding. And they don't want to fully understand what the other person is sharing. And so they do more damage because when you attack people unfairly who are teaching error, you're actually strengthening them. Does that make sense? So if somebody is presenting error and you don't take the time to actually present the truth, and you treat the person with contempt and his followers and his sympathizers with contempt, aren't you just going to help promote that error? Pretty much. I've seen it happen so many times. You know, people are presenting something which, you know, it it has some error in it. And instead of, of treating that person and just accepting them as a person, we, the first thing the church does is they get up some kind of board meeting. They decide that person is teaching error and they need, it needs to be addressed because if they keep presenting that error, you know, it's going to propagate in the church. And the reason it propagates is because of how the people are treated, not because of the error itself. The vast majority of the times, this is what I've seen. And I've seen when you just accept the person and realize he's presenting error and don't talk about the error and just let him say what he has to say. One of two things happens. Either that person goes somewhere else where he can find opposition because often that's what they want. Or over time that, that error that they were talking about, they just kind of set it aside because they've heard the truth presented and they start to realize it's error themselves. You know, we have to labor with people long if somebody's teaching error. We don't just cut them off the moment we we find that they're teaching error. But, of course, if somebody's preaching the truth, it's important to listen to what that person has to say. But, of course, you don't have truth on your side if they're presenting the truth. So usually that's why people are attacked. But Okay, so... um. So this is Spalding, Captains of the Host. And I think I have read this book um, a long time ago. But anyway, as we look back on the controversy, we perceive that it was the rancors aroused by personalities, much more than the differences in belief which caused the difficulty. The party of Butler, Smith, and Morrison believed in the theory of justification of faith. The party of Wagner and Jones believed in the performance of good works but bore almost exclusively upon faith as the factor of salvation, in salvation. Minds which could calmly reason could harmonize these views, but neither side was disposed to consider the other side calmly. Now, I'm not quite in agreement with that, obviously, right? So was it true that Wagner and Jones... Okay, there's almost nothing here that's really true, <laughs> right? It was really about truth and error. It wasn't about personalities. Uh, did Butler, Smith, and Morrison um, really understand justification by faith? I don't know. It, it's, if they, it's hard. Okay, if Spalding had been correct, yeah, then Butler, Smith, and Morrison would have not understood the theory they would have understood the truth of justification by faith. Yeah. Yeah, he just says the theory of justification by faith. So they were in agreement with the theory is what he's saying. And and then the party of Wagner and Jones believed in the performance of good works. 
but bore almost exclusively on faith as the factor in salvation. I don't think that represents Jones, Jones and Wagner's view at all. Well, <laughs> the, the ellipses that they put into this quotation are yeah. rather telling. Are what? Rather telling. Okay, well, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure what the ellipses are cutting out. But, I mean, could Jones and Wagner look at this at the other side calmly? I think they could. I would have to believe that they would have. Yeah. And and they spent a lot of time and patience uh, listening to what people were saying. So, so here's a more accurate assessment. Uh, so a more accurate assessment would be that the 1888 messengers bore almost exclusively on a faith which works by love, precisely as Paul preached it. That message with divine creden- credentials was not a compro- com- was not a compromising mixture of legalism and gospel. They did most emphatically proclaim righteousness by faith alone, but it was New Testament faith which demonstrates it built its built-in motivating power for true obedience to all the commandments of God. Now, now he has here testimonies to ministers, page 92, which he's not quoting it, but he's, he's paraphrasing something from that page. Now, when we think about, no, the one thing that they always talk about that Wagner and Short talked about is the motivating power. And and I, I've never really seen that in Jones and Wagner. Do you ever see Jones and Wagner talking about the motivating power? Because is it just a lack of motivation? No. Why we didn't obey God? No. Right? Now, this idea of the motivating power, this is this idea of uh, that you see in people in the 1888 message who follow the 1888 message study committee. And this idea of righteousness by faith is that we'll just have this motive. Somehow, if we behold Christ's love long enough, we will love, love begets love. And there's a truth to this. But that is what is motivating for true obedience. So so that's, that's the belief. But I never see this in Jones and Wagner. What I see in Jones and Wagner is the idea and and we've seen that when we were going through Jones, is that we recognize first that we are sinners by comparing ourselves to Christ and that we submit our lives totally to him. And, And his power comes from his word, his powerful word. God's word is the motivating power. Now, we could say it's God's love, but... But that's not what Jones and Wagner are talking about. It's not like we just see God's love and so we respond in human love. The fact is we don't have within us anything that can cause us to obey God's commandments. All of that comes from God alone. So if you put it as a motivating power, you get the idea that there's something that responds in us that motivates us to do righteousness. So I've never liked this motivating power idea that we see in uh, Whelan and Short. Okay, so I'm just that's just kind of an aside, but but there is some truth to it. But they have a a view that I don't agree with. But anyway, though, did those messengers who were declared to represent our Lord arouse the rancors that made heaven turn from the scene with shame? Would the Lord grant heavenly credentials to messengers who were not disposed to calmly reason? Ellen White for sure could never recognize precious light in unsanctified shouting or the unreasonable extreme teaching that our author ascribes to them, right? So so this idea that, you know, Jones and Wagner, you know, had unsanctified shouting and extreme teachings, this is still prevalent within the church today because this is what the church has been fed. 
uh, for a hundred and you know thirty some years since eighteen eighty eight. Back of the shameful scene at Minneapolis and back of the confusing shadows caused by our unbelief today stands the figure who was the rock of offense and the stone of stumbling at that fateful meeting. We come face to face with reality. Men professing godliness have despised Christ in the person of his messengers. Like the Jews, they reject God's message. He was not the Christ that the Jews had looked for. Today, The agencies that God sends are not what men have looked for. Um, What's FCE stand for? Page 472. Don't see that abbreviation too often. Okay. Christ has registered all the hard, proud, sneering speeches spoken against his servants as against himself. So we need to be careful when we speak against others, especially those who are presenting truth. I mean, just to speak against anybody in that way. I mean, have you heard these types of sneering speeches? Have we seen it within this movement? Have we done it ourselves? Too many times. Yeah. This is not the spirit of Christ. The true Christ has always been misapprehended. As often expected, he has as often been rejected. But modern Israel must overcome at last all past failures of ancient Israel. This will take place for we are living in the time of the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. This is a special end time work of overcoming that has never been completed in the past. Flesh and blood can never reveal to us the true credentials of the root out of dry, a dry ground that may stand before us. The story of 1888 teaches us that the ancient Jews will have to make room in history for us to kneel down beside them. Many say, if I had only lived in the days of Christ, I would not have rested his words or falsely interpreted his instruction. I would not have rejected and crucified him as did the Jews. But that will be proved by the way in which you deal with his message and his messengers today. The Review and Herald, April 11, 1893. The issue of 1888 was not how much emphasis to place on the preaching of this doctrine in relation to our other peculiar doctrines. The real issue was, what think ye of Christ? It is futile for us today to talk of establishing a right relationship with Christ unless we face this reality of 1888. Now, I would say, of course, you know, their focus is always upon 1888. But this would really have to do with the entire message of Adventism. Can we really understand Christ without understanding the prophetic periods and their fulfillments? Can we know who Christ is? Can we know him? Because this is what is all often urged, is that all of this prophecy stuff, we don't need it. We just need to know Christ. The question is, what Christ? Did Christ give those prophecies of himself or not? Are they not messages from God? Yeah. From Christ Christ himself. And and so for us to believe that we can be in a right relationship with Christ when we, we are not interested in the doctrines that are in Scripture. We're not interested in Scripture. We want to pick and choose the things we like. Anyway, in order to bolster our confidence that we do not need repentance, we have produced seminary theses to inquire what place the teaching of justification and righteousness by faith has been accorded alongside the distinctive tenets of the church. Graphs have been made counting the number of times the words righteousness, justification, faith, salvation, savior, and law have appeared in our Sabbath school quarterlies to prove that Seventh-day Adventists have not slighted the emphasis on salvation through Christ. Can computers now measure our faithfulness and prove that the true witness is wrong? If mere verbiage is the criterion, 
Roman Catholicism must be the most Christ-centered teaching in the world. While the Son of God continues to suffer, must we cast lots in various inquiries to see how to divide his vesture, this doctrine or tenet of righteousness by faith alongside the distinctive tenets of the church? The righteousness of Christ is vastly more than a mere verbal repetition. The grandest eschatology eschatological opportunity of the ages was rejected in our 1888 era, simply the opportunity for Christ to return. What was despised was in intimate heart reconciliation with Christ, such as a bride feels for her bridegroom. But verbiage and cold doctrine have been substituted for it. Dry homilies that split hairs between imputed and imparted righteousness, justification and sanctification, expiation and propitiation have made righteousness by faith become nauseating to many. The same trouble prevailed soon after 1888. Ellen White discusses the efforts of those whose hearts oppose the message. Many commit the error of trying to define minutely the fine points of distinction between justification and sanctification. Into the definitions of these two terms, they often bring their own ideas and speculations. Why try to be more uh, minute than is inspiration on the vital question of righteousness by faith? Why try to work out every minute point as if the salvation of the soul depended upon all having exactly your understanding on this matter? May we come to see how the living, loving Christ was insulted at Minneapolis and not the cold doctrine that was misunderstood? We distrusted those swellings of the heart, which were his drawings, and cast contempt upon him who was drawing us by terming his tenderness fanaticism. The tears that started to flow from the mysterious attraction of the uplifted cross drew from us zealous declaiming against enthusiasm, enthusiasm and fanaticism. Jesus knows our human nature. For he himself partakes of it still. He is a person. He too knows self-respect. He came very near to us in 1888. Not a soul of us dreams of what might have been in the sweet days that would have followed had we walked with him in heaven's glorious light. We often speak of 1888 as the great disappointment, or 1844 as the great disappointment. But 1888 was his disappointment. For we can read of how he loved us, that intimacy of love we would not have. Why should we marvel if he did not force it upon us? We were told at Minneapolis itself, no one must be permitted to close the avenue whereby the light of truth shall come to the people. As soon as this shall be attempted, God's spirit will be quenched. Let the love of Christ reign, reign in the hearts here. When the spirit of God comes in, love will take the place of variance because Jesus is love. If his spirit were cherished here, our meeting would be like a stream in the desert. No more tender calls, no better opportunities could be given them in order that they might do that which they ought to have done at Minneapolis. No one can tell how much may be at stake when neglecting to comply with the call of the spirit of God. The time will come when they will be willing to do anything and everything possible in order to have a chance of hearing the call, which they rejected at Minneapolis. Better opportunities will never come. Deeper feelings they will not have. Again, the testimony of Ellen White stretches our faith, but we must understand reality. Human hearts, trifled with the tender love of one who gave his blood for us. Finally, on the part of many in leadership, the trifling changed to what Ellen White sadly was forced to call hatred. Seven years after Minneapolis, she said to those many, you have turned your back and not your face to the Lord. The spirit of God is departing from many among his people. Many have entered into dark secret paths and some will never return. They have not only refused to accept the message, but they have hated the light. They are doing despite to his Holy Spirit. Heaven was indignant. There is an intimacy of divine personal grief involved here that is unique in modern religious history, perhaps in all time. 
We are reminded of the heart cries of Jeremiah and Hosea of old. Ellen White said at Minneapolis, if you only knew how Christ has regarded your religious attitude at this meeting. Four years later, there is sadness in heaven over the spiritual blindness of many of our brethren. Speaking of those who resist the spirit of God at Minneapolis, she says, all the universe of heaven witnessed the disgraceful treatment of Jesus Christ, represented by the Holy Spirit. Had Christ been before them, they would have treated him in a manner similar to that in which the Jews treated Christ. The scenes which took place at that meeting, Minneapolis, made the God of heaven ashamed to call those who took part in them his brethren. All this the heavenly watcher noticed. And it was written in the book of God's remembrance. These are sad words to record, but we cannot be honest and refuse um, to face their full implica implications. What the heavenly watcher noticed must also be written in the book of our remembrance. We can see ourselves in those dear brethren of a century ago. For there, but for the grace of God, am I. Okay. Well, I'm not going to go any further today. We will look at this one next week. And any thoughts about what we have read? Have you sent this to us or not yet? Or... Have I sent you this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll have to look it up. Then. Yeah. I sent you all I'm these sure. Quite a while ago. Okay, well, let's close in prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this evening, for the Sabbath. And we pray for your spirit throughout this day. We ask, Lord, that you can use us and that you can speak to us and that um, you can show us our need of you and that we can depend upon you and your righteousness by faith. Lord, we know we have nothing to offer. We have no love. We have no faithfulness. We have no righteousness. But we know, Lord, that you can work out your righteousness, your love, and your faithfulness in our lives. Help us to depend upon you in all things. And bless the Sabbath and uh, the meetings tomorrow morning. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.